let's discuss about the neat pg 23 session recall questions okay so what is the first question a 31 year old female delivered a 1 kg baby at 31 weeks of gestation the child has hepatosplenomegaly and jaundice on ct periventricular calcification are seen what is the most likely diagnosis okay so here they are generous they have just given you the finding a ct with periventricular calcification okay sometimes they will just give you the image and you have to identify hyperattenuating area adjacent to that of the ventricles these are your periventricular calcifications so from our cns sections i have already discussed this periventricular calcifications these are characteristically seen with your cmv infections what other uh, congenital virus uh, can lead to this particular appearance again you need to know that zika virus can also lead to periventricular calcifications so they have not given you zika so your answer is cmv okay now what about toxoplasmosis if i talk about toxoplasmosis they usually have more diffuse calcifications okay they have got more diffuse calcifications they may have cortical calcifications periventricular also there might be present but toxoplasmosis i would say it is not just periventricular they also have cortical calcifications what about the other features in toxoplasmosis they have hydrocephalus okay that is very very important in cmv zika virus there is an associated microcephaly as well Okay, there is microcephaly, there will be atrophy, all these particular features are also present. One very important point about CMV is that there is presence of polymicrogyria. Okay, this is very very important, this is a neuronal migrational problem and this is very commonly seen with that of CMV infections. Okay, what about herpes simplex? This usually will give you encephalitis. Okay, they have this encephalitis. Okay, so they will have this large cortical areas of involvement. What about parvovirus B19 infections? So, parvovirus B19, they will have anemias. Okay, patient will have anemia. Patient may also have what? Hydrops. Okay, so they may lead to abortions as well. Okay, to diagnose anemia, what investigations do we do? We do Doppler ultrasound. Okay, we need to do go for this particular fetal Doppler. And if I talk about this Doppler, you should know that the value in the fetal MCA, this will be more than 1.5 multiple of median. Okay, so this, this particular value they are basically showing you, this is basically diagnostic of fetal anemias. Okay, so this is basically a gross idea about the congenital infections which can be tested. Okay, so this is basically the image they can show you. These are your periventricular calcifications. Remember calcifications on a plane study, they will appear hyper attenuating. Okay, just like that of the bones. Moving towards our next question, a 32 year old presented with altered sensorium. CT reveals bi-temporal hemorrhage, okay. What is the diagnosis, okay. So, we know that temporal lobes may hemorrhage. This is not very commonly seen with stroke, okay. This is not commonly seen with hypertension, okay. This is something which we should know about herpes simplex encephalitis, okay. So, if I talk about the herpes simplex encephalitis, we have constantly stressed that they will present with asymmetrical bi-temporal encephalitis, but another important thing which I have already mentioned in my CNS class that this will be also hemorrhagic. There will be multiple hemorrhagic areas that will be present in them, right? So altered bitemporal hemorrhagic encephalitis, this is characteristically seen with what? With herpes simplex infections, okay? So this is very, very characteristic and this is very, very important and commonly tested. Sometimes they will just give you a image, okay? They will just give you a CT or an MR image with pathology in the bitemporal loops. You should know about the HSV encephalitis, okay? So let us just look at this MRI image. You can see that there is an area of involvement. This is basically a flare image in which they have shown you that there is bi-temporal involvement. Obviously, it is asymmetrical. Okay. Uh, this particular case is not hemorrhagic. If they want to show you hemorrhage, they may show you the GRE sequences or the SWI sequences with multiple blooming artifacts in this particular affected areas. Another classical area of involvement is not only temporal lobes, there is also this bilateral frontal lobes, inferior frontal lobes. Okay. So this is is basically T2 flare hyper intensity which is seen in a case of herpes simplex encephalitis involving the cortex to a larger extent. Okay. Let's move towards our next question. A 30 year old female presented to the hospital with abdominal pain, weight loss and sterile pyuria. Radiograph is shown below. What is the probable diagnosis? Okay. So first of all this is a KUB x-ray. 
okay this is a radiograph okay so this is a plane study no contrast has been given so whatever hyperattenuating things you are seeing over here apart from the bones these are your calcifications okay so you can see that this is a calcification just uh, in complete configuration of that of the right kidney what we are talking about we're talking about a calcified kidney patient is having sterile pyuria patient is having abdominal pain and weight loss all these particular features of pointing towards abdominal TB along with genitourinary TB. Okay, sterile pyuria is very very characteristic for your genitourinary tuberculosis. So, we are dealing with putty kidney. Okay, what is this putty kidney? It is a completely calcified end stage uh, disease that occurs in a cases of kidneys that are affected by that of tuberculosis. Okay, so you should know that putty kidney is actually autonephrectomy auto nephrectomy okay so similar thing we have also heard in sickle cell disease in which there is a auto splenectomy okay it will get completely calcified okay what about pyelonephritis pyelonephritis will give you if they want to test you they will basically show you a striated nephrogram okay they will show you a striated nephrogram what about medullary nephrocalcinosis so they will show you a kidney and they will show you calcifications that will be around the medulla Okay, they can give you clinical hints like the patient is having hyperparathyroidism, patient is having hypercalcemia, milk alkali syndrome or patient may have medullary sponge kidney disease in which there is a congenital ectasia of the collecting tubules. Okay, so if there is a congenital ectasia of the collecting tubules, what will happen? There will be calcifications that will be happening. There will be some uh, calculi that will be actually aggregating in that particular area that will lead to this medullary nephrocalcinosis. Uh, now, if I talk about medullary sponge kidney, it will also have a characteristic paint brush appearance on the IVP. Okay, this is characteristically seen with medullary sponge kidney. See, you need to jump from one particular topic to another topic, okay, especially when you are revising, you should know that what will happen in this, what are the given options, what will be the main significant pathology, what is the main significant imaging appearance in this particular option. So, just try to recall and then you can see that with one MCQ, you can cover many, many topics, okay. What about a staghorn calculus? So, staghorn calculus will look somewhat like this, the calcification which is there, it will be in the area of the pelvic calcium system like this okay it will have this particular clawed appearance also so that is basically your stag on calculus okay let us move towards our next question a 22 year old female presented with swelling in forearm the radiograph is given below what is the diagnosis so you can see that we have been given a history of 22 year old this is more than 20 years and this is our set criteria which we use for gct and chondroblastomas okay so, if you just see and focus on this particular x-ray, you can see that there is an expansile lytic lesion, there is a cortical destruction and you can see it is involving the subarticular area, okay, just beneath the wrist joint. There is an epiphyseal involvement and remember when we have discussed in our bone tumor section that epiphyseal tumors, there are very, very limited differentials. The two important ones are, I have shown you that less than 20, more than 20, more than 20, okay, they will be just giant so we can say that they have giant cell tumor okay if i talk about less than 20 and if i talk about less than 20 years and an epiphyseal lesion it is chondroblastomas it will be chondroblastomas so another way of looking is that they will show you a skeletally immature patient okay in which the growth plates have not fused that means they are pointing towards a younger age group and if they show you an epiphyseal lesion in that it is a case of chondroblastoma so let us so in this particular thing it is definitely a gct what about an aneurysmal bone cyst Okay, so aneurysmal bone cyst is usually not that aggressive looking. Okay, this GCT is also called as an osteoclastoma. It is basically an overactivity of the osteoclast. It is a little bit more aggressive. Okay, although it's a benign tumor, but it will look very, very aggressive and it will look very, very lytic. But if I talk about an aneurysmal bone cyst, it is relatively very, very well-defined lytic lesions. Sometimes you will be able to see septations within them. And also, if you do an MRI, you will be able to see the blood fluid levels within it. Okay, it is a multi-loculated or a multi-cystic appearance of the ABC. Okay, so if you just see this uh, particular slide, I've covered all the given options. So you can see this is a classical case of an osteochondroma with this particular stalk that is continuing with that of the medullary cavity. Okay, so this is basically your osteochondroma or exostosis. 
if you see the second image you can see that this is a skeletally immature patient so whenever this x-ray is given just decide whether it is skeletally mature or skeletally immature so this is a skeletally immature patient you can see that the growth plates have not fused and the lesion is present in the epiphyses which is very very well defined although it is a lytic lesion this is a chondroblastoma okay and lastly, if you see this particular lesion, this is again a skeletally immature patient, okay. And if you see this lesion is located in the distal metaphysis, okay. So, this is not involving the epiphyses or the subarticular region. And again, this is a skeletally immature patient. We are dealing with aneurysmal bone cyst. Another way of asking ABC is giving you an MRI image and it will show you multiple blood fluid levels within them, okay. Because there are hemorrhagic products which are present in the ABC. Moving towards our next question, a 35 year old patient with morning stiffness and reduced chest examination. Uh, so basically this is reduced chest movement. Okay. Also the patient has a complaint of red eye. What is the diagnosis on the basis of history and the radiograph? Okay, so the patient is presenting with morning stiffness. Okay, so basically they are talking about some inflammatory pathology that is basically affecting the spine. Okay, there is a morning stiffness that is happening. Okay, so what we are talking about is an arthritis which can be like an uh, ankylosing spondylitis or a rheumatoid arthritis. These particular pathologies usually present with this morning stiffness. Ankylosing spondylitis have a very characteristic history of a young male patient. Okay, so here they have not given anything about the sex of the patient but it is a young patient. Okay, they will give you a young patient who is presenting with morning stiffness and as he will be resuming his daily duties, his pain will be reduced. Also, they have given you a clinical hint of reduced chest movement. Okay, now another important thing is the red eye. So, red eye, basically when we talk about ankylosing spondylitis, this is the most common extra-articular manifestation is uveitis. Okay, it is a uveitis. Okay, another important uh, arthritis in which eyes can be involved, okay, in the form of iritis or conjunctivitis, it is basically your Reto syndrome. Okay, so if I talk about this, what is the diagnosis based upon the history and the radiographs of history? Say we are basically thinking that yes, it can be RA, it can be ankylosing spondylitis, there is no Reto that is given, there is no RA that is given, so it is definitely your ankylosing spondylitis. But even if you see the radiograph, it is very, very characteristic, you can see that there are multiple undulating osteophytes. Are they osteophytes? Okay. If you see on the sides, okay, you can see this undulating appearance. They are not osteophytes. Especially they are going from one end to another on both the side of the spine. These are your syndesmophytes. What are syndesmophytes? Syndesmophytes are nothing but they are ossification of the outer fibers of annulus fibrosis. So if you know that this is vertebra, Okay, there is this particular intervertebral disc with a central nucleus pulposus. There is an annulus fibrosus. You can see that there are inner fibers and outer fibers. If this particular outer fibers they undergo ossification, which happens in the case of ankylosing spondylitis, patients are HLA B27 positive. These are syndesmophytes. Okay, so again, I, I can just show you these are your syndesmophytes. Okay, these are your syndesmophyte. Now, remember that if there is an ossification along the supra and the infraspinous ligament, okay, what will it give rise to? It will give rise to a dagger spine. It will give rise to a dagger sign. On the other hand, the syndesmophytes, okay, this flowing syndesmophytes, these are called as a bamboo spine. Okay, remember that this particular spine is very, very stiff. They can break. They can give rise to this spinal fractures, especially in the area of the cervical spine or the thoracolumbar spine junction. That will give rise to what is called as a carrot stick fractures. Okay. Another important thing is that together dagger sign plus the bamboo spine appearance. What is it called as? This is called as the trolley track sign. What is it called as? It is called as the trolley track sign. Another sign which you should know, the Romana sign or the shiny corner sign, that is the first impression on a radiograph. Okay, there will be some erosions that you can see at the entero superior corner. Okay, and that will be healing by sclerosis, giving rise to the shiny corner sign. What about your, uh, say, Anderson lesion? Okay, it is basically a non infective spondylodiscitis, which also occurs in a case of ankylosing spondylitis. So, you should be very, very thorough with all the signs relating to ankylosing spondylitis. It's a very, very high yield topic. Okay. So, just to revise, again, you can see that this particular area, this is your dagger sign. If you see, this is a dagger 
dagger spine plus you see bamboo spine together this will give rise to what is called as a trolley track appearance okay moving towards our next question a 45 year old female who has to undergo radiotherapy for the treatment of the carcinoma cervix stage 2b which of the following statement is true regarding ionizing radiation so we have discussed all these things in the radiotherapy session so let us just move towards each and every option the normal cell and the cancer cells will be equally sensitive so absolutely this is wrong okay why it is wrong because i have already uh, uh, explained you the law of bergoni what happens according to the law of bergoni there will be the cells that will be some cells which will be rapidly dividing rapidly replicating they will be definitely more radio sensitive okay the undifferentiated cells they will be more radio sensitive as compared to that of a normal cell okay so this is not to the case the cancer cells are definitely more radio sensitive the gi mucosa is the more resistant part so i have already told you that the cells that are actively dividing like the gi mucosal cells the epithelial cells the lymphocytes these are very very radio sensitive cells okay so this is also incorrect small blood vessels are resistant to the effect of the radiation absolutely wrong obviously they are not resistant they are prone to the radiation changes and that will lead to vasculitis changes okay they can lead to this uh, obliterative fibrosis in the small vessels right so that is a complication of the radiation therapy what about the given option c the radiation at any point is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the source okay so this is basically in keeping with your inverse square law the intensity of the radiation is inversely proportional to the distance okay so this is also a law that has been used for the radio protection and it is also used in radiotherapy more will be the distance less will be the intensity of the radiation and it is absolutely true right so this is all about your neat pg 23 session recall questions thank you hope you like the session